Hello, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. We have the Reverend Marshall Davis with us, author of 16 books, and also the awesome podcast, The Tao of Christ. Reverend Davis, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited to talk to you today about non-duality, but most importantly of all, non-dual Christianity. Yeah, very good. I'm interested to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, so so we're going to we're going to dive right in. I've got a, a small preamble. The the name of the show is Talk Gnosis. We talk a lot about Gnosticism, but also mystical Christianity, sometimes Christianity and biblical studies in general. And I contest that Gnosticism, which is not always a very useful term, I find it to be a useful term. It's often thought of as the the most ultimate dualistic theology, which I think is incorrect. I I think it's qualified monism. Uh, I think it is ultimately a a path of non-duality. But we don't talk enough about non-duality on this show. So I'm going to open up, as I like to do on the show, with a very easy question that I'm sure will only take a second to answer. (laughs) What is (laughs) non-duality? The only good answer to that is silence. <laughs> yes, yes. But I guess you would say it's simply, the, the word itself simply means not to. And so what it talks about, it's, it's pointing to oneness, but not one as opposed to another one. And not one as opposed to two or three or four, but one without any second. So we're talking about reality being, being one and only appearing to be many. Of, of course, the name of your podcast is The Tao of Christ. And if we encounter ideas about non-duality and spirituality in general, we often associate it with Eastern traditions like Taoism, forms of Hinduism, forms of Buddhism. So is non-dual Christianity, is it a kind of postmodern reinterpretation of Christianity where we're reinterpreting it through the lens of these Eastern theological tools? Or is it actually something that's central to the Christian tradition? I would not... I would say it's not either of those. It's it is a reinterpretation. I wouldn't say postmodern reinterpretation because the way I understand postmodernism is basically it says that there is no truth that you make your own truth. You know, and I would say there is truth, and so it would not be postmodern. But it definitely is a reinterpretation of Christianity as Christianity is commonly understood, because Christianity as it has traditionally existed is definitely a, a dualistic type of religion. So you would have to reinterpret it. I would also not say that it's non-duality is central to Christianity because, like I said, Christianity is, uh, by nature, dual dualistic. I do think that uh, there are examples of non-duality throughout Christian history and in Christian scripture. But it is not the main emphasis of Christianity. The main framework has been theism. And theism, by its nature, is dualistic because you have a creator God set over against the, a creation. So that's the center. That's traditional Hebrew religion, traditional Judaism, traditional Christianity, and Islam. So this is definitely something, what I'm talking about, is definitely something different than that. But I think that non-duality is present in all the religious traditions of the world. It's not central to them all, but it is present to them all. It's, it is present in some traditions more than others, and it's present in Buddhism, especially the original Theravadan Buddhism, I think, more than the later Mahayana Buddhism. It's present in uh, uh, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, more so than other forms of, of Hinduism. But as, as a whole, you could say it's more present in those religions because, for example, the U- Upanishads points to non-duality over and over again. You're not going to find any collection of Christian scriptures that point to non-duality over and over again. But it is present, and that's what I pick up on. Yeah, and I, I think, too, if, if we're saying that it's present, that it's in there, I'd say a lot of people say that, that it's not apparent. When they look to the Bible or to the liturgy, where in Eastern texts, I can just find this plainly laid out theology of non-duality in very clear language. Sometimes the language, maybe clear language is a stretch, but because sometimes the language is paradoxical. But we have statements of there being no dualities, ultimately, of no self, what have you. 
clear doctrines and teachings of non-duality, but I think some people would struggle to define that in Christianity. Can you elaborate where we can find it in the bedrocks of Christianity? Like I said, Christianity as itself, I don't think would have it, although you do find it in Scripture. I think that, that when I think Jesus experienced this and proclaimed this. I think his most basic message, his earliest message, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When you understand what repent means and what he means by the kingdom of God, as illustrated in, in his parables, but he is speaking about this. I think he experienced this. He experienced the divine as this, and he tried to communicate this. And he saw himself as one with this divine reality. And that is what got him crucified, basically, because it was so different than the dualistic, theistic religion of his time. So it's present there, especially in Jesus. I think you see episodes of it in the Old Testament at all, I th especially in the Old Testament also. I think that uh, the wisdom books of the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, is, is I think, a book of deconstruction that the preacher, the, the the author of Ecclesiastes was trying to take apart the traditional Hebrew religion of his time. I think Job was doing exactly this, the, the same thing as that. And he, he didn't buy into this, uh, this what, what the Easter would talk about as karma, that, that you reap what you sow. He says, it's not true in my own experience. And he, and he kept digging away at it more and more until he came face to face uh, with this one reality that he had no words for. So you see, those are some examples. It's present there, but it is definitely a minor voice. It is a, a minority voice in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures, whereas in some of the Buddhist and Hindu scriptures, it is the majority voice. So I think that, and, and of course, most Christians would not admit to what I just said. They would say that this is not true at all. They would say that this is trying to impose an Eastern religious philosophy uh, onto Christianity and trying to use Christian terminology for to communicate Eastern religions. That's what, they were, that's what they do accuse me of doing. I don't think that's what I'm doing. I think I'm actually uh, discovering something that's there, but just not has been given voice to very much. Yeah, and thank you so much for bringing up Ecclesi Ecclesiastes and Job, because I deeply love those books, and I think your interpretation is spot on. And I think it's a very beautiful and powerful way to to read those sometimes difficult texts. But but moving on to the, a more theological point, a more theological question that's going to be on anybody's minds if they're first encountering non-duality, which is non-duality is the truth, the ultimate truth. Why Why do we experience dualities? Yeah, that's a question for everyone, for it, is, is the non-dual community, and there's no good solution to that. I was reading, rereading some Ellen Watts recently, and he keeps going back over and over again that God is playing hide-and-seek with God's self, you know. That's what his solution to it is. I think in a Christian framework, we would point to what traditional Christian theology calls the fall, something happened early in human history that that brought us into this duality. I think the eating of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, that itself is obviously the tree of duality. And that is what we, what is what human beings partook of. And I think that is actually pointing to our very early human development when we became homo sapiens, that all of a sudden we, we reached this threshold of self-identity. And with that self-identity came this awareness of the world that has allowed all these technological advances to, with human civilization throughout history. But with that came the downside, and that is the separation uh, that we feel from the rest of the world and the anxiety and the suffering that comes from that separation. And I think the way I understand the fall is that every human being goes through this from infancy, and, and it's a very natural thing to go through. And it really can't be avoided. And, and yet that is the cause of this apparent duality that we perceive of, and then get lost in, forgetting what we were before. 
we saw ourselves as different than everyone else and everything else. Now, now for those who aren't familiar with you, you, you spent the four decades, right, as a pastor. And I'm sure you were with people, counseling people, present with people, going through some really heavy stuff, right? Some real examples of suffering. And I'm wondering if all your years of pastoral experience, do, do you find non-dual teachings to be practical for the day-to-day -day struggles that people can go through? Because sometimes when I think of particularly Eastern texts, that are associated with non-duality. They're, they're very intellectual. It's years of study. There's a lot of, again, paradox, contradiction, background knowledge I feel like I have to know to begin to understand these texts. So is it more of an intellectual thing or is it, can it be practical to really help people understand what they're going through? I don't think it's intellectual at all. You can develop an intellectual system from it, but it's not a, a, an intellectual or academic or mental system. It is not a system of thought. It's a it's an awareness of what is. And it is very practical because we're talking about, as a Buddha made it real clear in his four noble truths and eightfold path, that this is about the cessation of suffering. And all that you talked about, all these ministry issues that people go through in their lives all have to do with suffering of some type, intellectual, psychological, emotional, existential uh, suffering. And this, this is, as the Buddha said, a cessation of that suffering. It is a way to, to move beyond it. And uh, of course, it's not at all perfect in any of our lives. Maybe it was for the Buddha oh. or someone, but for, for most of us, it is a process, but it is a process that can be begun and can be done by anyone. As we, as if, when we do not get so caught up with problems that we see is, is out there that are our enemies, when we instead embrace what is happening and we see it all as one and we are that oneness, then they, and the suffering relaxes around all of these issues that we're talking about. So it's extremely practical and much more practical than I would say that intercessory or petitionary prayer when you're hoping God is going to do something to change what's happening out there. This is a way of accepting what's happening because it's not out there. It's in here. And it's all around. This is what we are. The problems are not out there attacking us. We are the problem. And to relax into that problem and realize it's not a problem, so that's the end of this type of suffering. Yeah. I made a little list of kind of pivotal or at least doctrines and ideas that, that a lot of people, even people who know nothing about Christianity, aren't Christians, would associate as being essential to, to the faith. I was wondering if we could go through them and talk about the non-dual perspective, non-dual ideas uh, about some of these doctrines, theologies, traditions, what have you. And, and I think an important one to start with would be the divinity of Christ. Yeah, the uh, Christology was the was what consumed the early church for during the first really four, five, five centuries, four hundred years or, or more of the early church, as all these creeds, these councils we're talking about, has to do with uh, the nature, person nature of Christ, and related to that is the question of the uh, Trinity. And I see in the Christology that Christ, the, the traditional understanding is that Christ is both human and divine. And that, of course, is blasphemy to Judaism at the time and and is blasphemy to Islam who sees it as shirk, idolatry. It, yet this is what Christ, Christians experienced in Jesus and experienced in their oneness with Jesus. And so that so they were pushed to affirm the divinity of Christ and the full humanity of Christ at the same time. There were a lot, if you know your church history, then you know there's a lot of pushback and different ways of trying to adjust these two sides, if you want to call them, of, of Jesus, the humanity and divinity. But from a non-dual point of view, 
see the two as one. There's no, no problem at all that Jesus is human and divine because everybody is human and divine. There is no human and divine. There is the divine human one, the non-dual one, oneness. And, and I can even see, even though we weren't designed this way, I see things, doctrines like the incarnation, which has to do with the divinity of Christ, and the Trinity as functioning Zen Cohen's. Now, Zen Cohen's are different as so far as they were designed to, to elicit a breakthrough into Satori, into non-dual awareness. And I don't think these doctrines were meant to do that. They were meant to try to figure out intellectually what was going on. But I think that when you meditate upon them, that they accomplish the same thing. That what cannot be understood intellectually makes no sense. It is simply contradiction or paradox. When it is embraced as see as true, then there is a breakthrough through that dualistic thinking into a non-dualistic way of perceiving the world. That's how I approach those. Yeah, amazing. Can we move on to an idea that you already mentioned, which is God being the all-powerful creator? That's, that is a creator uh, implies a creation, which is a self-dualistic. And so there is no creator creation. There is just the one reality that includes everything including what we would perceive as a creator. If you want to talk about everything that is emanating from God, you could do that. Just once I start thinking about saying these words, they are not, they are true. I realize they are true. But there is, it's not like everything emanates from God. Sometimes people talk about pantheism, everything is God. Or I had one person say, no, it's not pantheism, it's panentheism. I say, it's no matter how, what word you want to describe it, how you want to try to think about it, it still means that they are one. That what is God and what is seen to be not God is in fact one that has to transcend your idea of God and not God. That is why a lot of people talk about the Godhead or the God beyond God, is what both Tillich and Meister Eckhart describe, because they understand that a lot of people their idea of God itself is dualistic. So you have to have another word for, for that non-duality that includes God and not God. And so you have to go with these other terms, like Godhead or God beyond God. I think coming to some of those practical ideas that we were talking about previously, but forgiving others, forgiveness. When you... Non-duality puts you in the shoes of, of others. Jesus from the cross, while he's being crucified, says, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus was able to do that because he could see himself in their shoes. He could say, he could, he realized that he wasn't any different than them. And that to forgive them would be the same thing as to be, to forgive himself. Just like loving your neighbor and loving your enemy is the same thing as loving yourself. As Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He could do that. He could even love his enemy because he saw he was his enemy, that he was his neighbor. He was, they were his self. We are one self. We are one, one being with a capital B. And so forgiveness is, is not a difficult task to do once you are seeing the world and the relationship correctly from this non-dual perspective. Uh, being born again. Yeah, which is uh, John chapter 3, Jesus' uh, conversation with the Jewish leader and Nicodemus. I think what Jesus was talking about at that time was this was spiritual awakening, a non-dual reality. I think that's what Jesus experienced at his baptism and that Jesus was talking about here when he says you have to be born of the water and the spirit, I think he was thinking back to his, his own baptism when they he went under the water, he came up and the spirit of God descended upon him. He's talking that is the that was Jesus' rebirth. Now if traditional Christians say Jesus didn't need to be born again because they were sinless and all this. But I think Jesus is, is, is like us, that he was born again and he was inviting others to experience exactly what he experienced. Yeah. 
And, uh, do you think it happened at his baptism? That was his enlightenment experience where he realized? Yeah, yes. No yeah, problem. I think that Jesus' baptism was the same as the Bodhi tree experience for the Buddha. And, uh, and uh, in connection to the Buddha's awakening, there was this Samara, this, this devil character that tempted him. And that's, we have that right after Jesus the baptism. He goes out in the wilderness for 40 days and he struggles with the devil. And I think that was him trying to reconcile this. It didn't make sense to him because it doesn't make sense to any of us when we go through this. But, so we have to try to get a head, head around it. We have to get, get our heart around it, get everything connected again, once again, because we're falling apart. We need to be reconnected. We need to be literally reborn, recreated, and uh, resurrected after we've died. You know, that's, that's what we have to do here. That's what Jesus did in the in the wilderness. And then after those 40 days, then he immediately began to proclaim this message using the language that was, he didn't have this language. He didn't, I know some people think Jesus went to India and, or Tibet or something, but I don't think there's any validity to that at all. This is something that Jesus knew what Jesus experienced that he was trying to express using the language and the, the religious tradition that he had, that he knew. Yeah. Repentance. The Greek, Greek word metanoia, for, which is the word for repentance, means li literally beyond the mind. Meta is beyond. Noia, nuos, is the mind. So he's talking about beyond the mind. So he's basically saying you have to go beyond the mind. Now, it has other uses, this word does too. And it means to, to turn around. So it means, to, it means that you actually are looking at your, yourself. You're, you are you're turning inward to see what you really are. You know, that's a turning around there too. As well as a secondary sense, where most Christians would interpret this word, is to change the path that you're on. You're walking down one path, you turn around, you go back in the other direction. Walking past the sin, turn around, right. the path of righteousness. That's the way they're talking about. And, but I think there's a much more to it than that. I think there is this internal seeing and looking and knowing that it's only by inward searching, the self-inquiry a lot of non-duality talks about. I think that's what metanoia means too. So that's, that is what metanoia really means when you take out the exclusively moralistic interpretation of it. There's a moral aspect to it. There's no doubt about it. The Buddha had his eightfold path. It was all about right everything, right thinking and living and everything. So there is definitely morality to this that accompanies to it. And that's one, one weakness, I think, of a lot of modern non-duality that's not connected to a religious tradition, that it does not have this moral framework of a religious tradition tradition that can protect it from the the abuses that you see by some of these gurus and some of these self-proclaimed non-dual teachers. They don't have that community. They don't have that moral framework that it's absolutely necessary. That's why the Buddha had created the Sangha, the community with that that supported the Eightfold Path. That's why Jesus established that Lysia, the church's community, to that they had this as rich Hebraic moral framework, and I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to, to deviate or to stay on that subject before moving on, <laughs> having experiences of non-duality, it doesn't turn you into a perfect superhuman, right? Like you, you're still going to be able to make mistakes, or as you said, maybe even get high on your own supply and declare yourself a guru on YouTube and go out there and <laughs> teach non-duality and perhaps not do nice things to people. Would, would you say that that's right. correct? That, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see, I mean, it could be empirically verified just by uh, you, what happens. To, uh, the appears that sometimes happens in some of these we might call cultic groups that might teach this type of thing. They get carried away and they get absorbed into it and get carried away into immoral or coercive, psychologically coercive type of behavior. So, yeah, it, there is no difference between anybody. I am the same as you. I'm the same as everybody else. It's just that it is far, it's just that we have different egos, these different personalities that have developed and they have different strengths and weaknesses. But at the core, we are the same. There's this one self, capital S, that, that is 
who we really are. And the others are just fantasies. It's just fiction. We can act out these fantasies and believe we are these fictions if you want, but that's not what we really are. Yeah. Coming back to these doctrines, ideas, theologies that a lot of people think are incredibly central to Christianity, and of course we can debate if they are if they are not, but if you grab somebody on the street and got them to name a few, I, I bet you a lot of people would say life after death. Yes, uh, that's the, in, in popular evangelical Christianity today, it's all about where you go after you die, where you that's the question. Are you going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell? And that itself is about as dualistic as you could poss possibly get. And, and sometimes Jesus's parables seem to portray that type of dualism. But I see, I see these as stories that Jesus is telling to try to get beyond the duality. Because Jesus clearly talked about the kingdom of God is being present here and now, as well as sometime in the future. Of course, there is no... If eternity is here now, there is no real future or past. It's only here now. And, and the heaven and hell, as Jesus talks about it, I think is primarily talking about here and now. Now, after these bodies die, we something, if you want to talk about after, it's hard to talk about after if you don't really believe in time, but we are what we are now. We are what we always have been. We are now what we were before we were born and what we will be after we die. That eternal life is present now. It's not just something that happens after death. It's, it is present here and now, and it's not going to change after death. Now, this consciousness, this human consciousness, is going to disappear with the body, but the eternal life and what I really am does not disappear with the body. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, something that's probably on a lot of people's minds every time they, they open up a newspaper or turn on uh, CNN or what have you is, so not just religious people, but uh, obviously lots of religious people, lots of Christians, is, is the apocalypse. What's the non-dual take on the apocalypse? <laughs> I don't know if there is a non-dual take on the apocalypse, but I have to admit that when I take Jesus' teachings seriously, when I study them and read them, Jesus did seem to have an eschatological message. That he seemed to think that that there was going to be a breaking in of this kingdom of God, which I think is what he meant, the word, the term he used for non-dual reality, a seeing of this non-dual reality, that is going to break into or consume time and space. And I think that Jesus actually thought it was going to happen very soon. I think it was going to happen in the lifetime of the people that he was talking to. See, Jesus didn't wasn't perfect. Jesus simply all of admitted he wasn't perfect. He didn't know everything. See, some things the Father knows, the Son doesn't know. I mean, you can't assume that everything Jesus says is that you know exactly what was going to happen, especially when it comes to uh, what is normally called the end times. Jesus said that very clearly. He didn't know about, about, about this. But he seemed to think, and it was going to happen soon. It was going to happen with the destruction of Jerusalem. It happened in 70, 70 AD. But of course it didn't. The 70 AD came and went and it's still going on. And we still have these uh, doomsday preachers that say it's going to happen some year and the years come and go. Yeah, they aren't here. I think, to, to, to sum it up, I think that all these eschatological teach, teachings are really trying to give some urgency to this decision to to give oneself entirely to God, to this non-dual reality. It, it, I mean, we need some type of urgency to it. That was certainly true in my life, because this spiritual awakening in my life happened when I was given what I thought was a death sentence at the time. I thought I was going to die of a, of a medical diagnosis that ended up being a misdiagnosis. But I'm very grateful for it, because it put that urgency the eschatological apocalyptic urgency into my life that gave birth to this. So it's a very helpful technique, but maybe that's why Jesus used it, because it does break people through. And when people, you read all the time about people that are given a death sentence, and all of a sudden it changes the way they see the world, and suddenly they, things that were seem important aren't important anymore, and the things that are important, the people and relationships, all of a sudden become important. So it changes people's lives. That's a, a type of spiritual awakening of, our, of a different type. 
I think that the eschatological aspect to it, the apocalyptic aspect to it, I think has that same momentum that, that pushes us into spiritual awakening. Yeah, beautifully said. I think we are uh, leading towards talking about the end. I think we were just about there for the show, unfortunately. Okay. But I would like to tell everybody where to find you, which is marshalldavis.us. We have it up on the screen for those watching. We're going to have it down in the show notes for everybody else. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Reverend Davis has many books, but you also have your podcast. You have other appearances. So please check out his work. Also, if you want to help us keep the show going, it's patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can kick in as little as a dollar per piece of media per month to keep us going. You could do the fun time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And we understand if you're unable to help us financially, you can just tell people about the show. Take this episode and send it to somebody. They're going to love it. So, Reverend Davis, thanks so much. Thank you, John, for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. Bye-bye. All right.